morning everybody, great to see you all again. Well, all my calendars have gone out now, so that was quite exciting. I had a few issues, so this was a print that I, I, I signed. Can you see the obvious issue with this? I actually quite like it this way around, but obviously it's meant to be that way around. Late nights signing just got the better of me. So I've got a coffee now to keep me awake. And we're gonna need a bit of time for this Lightroom tutorial. I'm quite excited about this. It's been something that I've wanted to do for quite quite a few months, really. I've had a lot of people ask me how I edit my photos in Lightroom. And I've got sort of seven steps that I always do, the things that I always do on every photo to make sure that I get them looking as best as I can. So get a coffee and let's dive into Lightroom. <laughs> Okay, let's go into the basic settings. So the first thing I would do is just scroll down to lens corrections and I, um, I've automatically set it to remove chromatic aberration in my default settings for Lightroom and then I enable profile corrections. Now in this one, the raw file has embedded the profile correction for this particular lens, my Fuji X-T2 and 10 to 24. And if I rolled over this um, I button here, then you can see that Lightroom's telling me that. Now with my Nikon, it doesn't do that, so Lightroom does that correction. I always do that first, so then I go back to the basic tab, and the first thing I would then do in the edits is go and look at cropping it. So I'll probably crop it this way a little bit. I might come back and change this afterwards, but I, want, I always like to do a first initial crop. I just want to move it down a tiny bit there and do that crop. And then I would go down this and do the first basic settings. So I'm gonna slightly warm the image up and I might come back and change this later because when I go into point two, which is around color, I, I'll come back and probably edit the temperature a little bit differently. So I'll probably look at changing the exposure. And I'm not too worried if I start to burn out the sky here because I can bring that back when I start to apply other sort of local edits to the image. I'm gonna significantly increase the contrast because I wanna bring out this sort of beam of light that sort of came down to this valley. This was a workshop um, that I was taking in the Lake District and we had this amazing evening. We got this really, really great light. And what I want to do with this image is create that story, tell that story about this really strong light coming down. So then I'm gonna go further down, maybe just reduce the highlights slightly just to bring those back in here. Again, I might change that with a curve later and come back and, and tweak these. It's very much an iterative process. I'm going to pull out some of the shadow detail just to um, counteract a little bit of that contrast. Maybe increase the white slightly and I'm going to reduce the blacks a little bit. And then I'm going to add a little bit of clarity. And again, I might come back to that later. So clarity is just bas basically local contrast. Um, so it, it, you don't want to overdo it because you get really funny edges, but it's, it's really good for just pulling out local contrast in images. So now if we look at the before and after of this image with these basic settings. And you can see that's before and then that's after. So we're starting to get something that looks quite good. So the next one, point number two, is color and how important color is in being able to tell that story and being able to improve the composition of your image. And I talked about that in a video that I did a few months ago on composition. So take a look at it if you haven't seen. Um, I talk a lot about color and composition and how that works really well together, talking about the color wheel. So we'll stick with this image for now and then I'm going to show and demonstrate some of these points on different images as well. And I'm going to do them in order of how I do them. So I would look at the white balance, then I would probably look at the HSL slider, which I'll go into in a minute. Then I would look at split tone in the image. And then I potentially look at the tone curve and actually going into each channel and changing the red, blue, and green on the tone curve. And then finally, I may go into the camera calibration and change the color. The last two, the tone curve and the camera calibration, I don't do that often. It's usually white balance, then the HSL slider, and then potentially for some images, split toning. And they're the three tools that I tend to use more often than not for fine tuning the color of my image. So for instance, in this image here, I've obviously changed the white balance a little bit. Um, the next thing I'll probably do is go into the HSL slider. And what I want to do is probably just change these greens a little bit. Now, usually what I find is that it's the yellow and green sliders that change it. Now, what you can do is you click this little button here and I can just click on a point here 
and that will then show me which sliders are affected for that color. So I usually do that first to see what will change it, but I then switch that off and then go and manually change these to fine tune my image. So in this particular image, I want it to look slightly lusher, the green. Yep, so I've done that. I also want to change the blue. So again, I go and choose this and I can see that the aqua and the blue are the two colors that have been changed. And then I can go and change them until I think that, that they're more in keeping with the rest of the image. And I'll probably come back and alter that when I've put a graduated filter on the sky, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And then I would go and look at the saturation, I'd probably increase the saturation, the green and the yellow. So I tend to, when I'm changing saturation, ch change it locally against colors rather than against the whole image. And if I do do it against the whole image, I do that right at the end. And then I may also um, increase the brightness of the yellow slightly. So yeah, I might just wanna pull that out a little bit because it seems that these highlights are here. So that's looking better. There's a lot to do on this image, but we're getting there, things are starting to improve. And yeah, I mean, that's that, that's color. So let's go and have a look at another couple of images and just show how color can alter those images and how I've used color to, to edit those images. So this shot that I took of the bluebells this spring, I, I, I was really pleased with. I really like this fern in the foreground. Again, this was taken with my Fuji X-T2 and 10 to 24 millimeter lens. And if I look at the before, so before I've edited this, then that's the before version of it. And then basically I've just turned it into that. So there's not a huge amount of change and it looks like it's just been, it's just been brightened up a little bit. I haven't changed the exposure a huge amount. What I have done is, is ed done a lot of basic edits. You can see that I brought the blacks right up because I wanted it to still maintain a little, of this, little bit of this mysterious element. But on this image, what I wanted to particularly talk about is the color because this is where HSL and split toning came into their own. So I spent quite a lot of time messing around with the sliders in HSL to get the saturation and hue of the colors in this image exactly right and how I wanted them to look and how I felt they were when I actually took the photo. Now with bluebells, anybody that's um, taken bluebells has probably had a conversation of what color bluebells are, whether they're lilac or purple or blue. And it's sometimes difficult to get that right in camera, depending on what sort of camera you have. You know, certainly if I take it with my Fuji and my Nikon in JPEG, um, then they'll both come up with something that looks very different, even if I set the white balance the same. So it, you can then change this quite easily by just picking the hue of the bluebell and, and moving it from left to right. So for instance, if I just thought that these bluebells should have been more blue, then I can just move it to left. If I thought they should have been more purple, then I can move it to the right. Now, I, I, I personally think that that's about right. Everyone's gonna disagree with me on this. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Well, there probably is a right answer because they are the actual color they are, but you've got a bit of creative license with it. And then the other thing that I did with, with this image is split tone it. So split toning is a, a basically a way of looking at the luminance values within your image and whether that's the shadow um, luminance values, so the darker parts of the histogram or the lighter parts of the histogram, which is the highlights luminance values, and then changing the hue and the saturation of that hue across the board, across all the pixels within that luminance range. So, the way I usually do that is I, I, I bump the saturation right up and then I change it to the color that I think is about right. So in this case, I want it to be quite green. And then I reduce the saturation until I think it's not overdone. So that's zero. And I might just bring it up to about there. So I'm not changing it very much. It's quite subtle, but it does make a difference. And then I, again, I do the same with the shadows and, and move them around. And if I just switch this on and off, you can see it just has a subtle, it almost just creates just a little bit of a, 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 warm is probably not the right word, but just blends those colors together just a little bit nicer. It, it, it basically brings color tones closer together. So 
yeah, I really like doing that. I don't do it with all my images, probably about 20% of my images, but it, it does it does make a difference. I've also want to show you color on another image, which is this image. So again, if, if I look at the before, which is that, and then the after. Now I've done a lot of local contrast changes on this as well. But what I did in this image, if I go to the HSL slider, is reduce the saturation of the blue, which is all this element. So if I just change this, you can see that the blue element of this image is the sky. And I, I think this makes a significant difference to the feel of this image. And I wanted to take that blue out of the image, so I reduced the saturation of the blue. So using the HSL and the split toning, I think you can be quite creative and you can do some quite clever things with your, with your image. On to point number three, which you're using brushes and filters, and particularly gradient filters, in your image. So sticking with this image, let's have a look at point number three, which is brushes and filters and how important they are. So if I just look at the filters that I've got on here, I've got three graduated filters. I'm actually going to add another graduated filter because I want to darken the sky just a little bit more just to make it just slightly more moody, this image. It was a series of images that I posted on Instagram as part of my Pharaohs series and I wanted to have those images look quite similar and create a quite a dramatic mood because I felt that when I was in the Pharaohs it was a dramatic place. So I want to darken the sky down a little bit more so I'm just going to create a graduated filter there and I've all already dialed in a little bit of negative exposure um, and then I can just have a play with that until I think that that's about right I'm probably going to reduce the blacks a little bit but what you can see is it's also darkened here so if you want and you do have something like that you can you can use this brush tool and the erase tool and I just switch on the mask overlay here and it shows me what's been altered and then I might just roughly just just change that. Now you've got to be careful, I've done that far too much. Um, so I've probably just got to sh lower my brush down and I'm just going to paint that on there. Now what I find is that sometimes doing this it's too obvious so you've got to spend a little bit of time getting it right and maybe you just need to create two graduated filters, one here and then another one a little bit higher to darken the sky more. But if I just switch that off and then shut that down now, we can have a look at that. And I think, yeah, that's looking pretty good now. Um, I'll probably spend a little bit more time over it. But on, on the whole, I think that looks fairly good. Okay, so finally on this point, I just want to go into the brushes a little bit. So if I just click here and, and choose an adjustment brush, I'm going to do this really rough and ready. So what I want to do is reduce, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. I want to reduce the um, exposure and contrast in the dark areas. So I'm gonna just set in a bit of negative exposure, a little bit of contrast, reduce the blacks a little bit, and, and I'm gonna paint that in. So what I wanna do is just, just reduce the blacks a little bit. Again in here, I want to do the same. Because what I wanna do is just create more drama again into the image. I don't want to overdo it though. So I think that's that's probably okay. So point number four is using these graduated filters but actually using the range mask. So going back to these graduated filters, I've all, all, also put one on here if I just show you this one that affects the image in a slightly different way. So you can see that it's just picking out the greens in the image. And that's how I do local color changes and local color contrast changes with th this graduated tool. So what I've done is I've just created a graduated filter there. I'll do that again, so I'll repeat this. So if I just delete that, all I'm gonna do is put a graduated filter in. It doesn't really matter where it is as long as it's gonna incorporate all this element here. I'm just gonna reset the exposure there and the saturation. And now I'm going to scroll down and switch this range mask on. And what this allows me to do is say, with this graduated filter, only apply it to a certain color range or a certain luminance range. So in this case, I'm going to go color, choose the picker, and I'm going to say, okay, just select this color range here. And once I've done that, I can hover over it. And you can see that it's selecting quite a lot of other stuff as well. So I might just want to just reduce that down a little bit. And once you've selected the area that you think you want to edit, which is these greens, then I can do 
some quite clever things because I can then just on these greens change the clarity. Um, I could also maybe reduce the highlights, increase the whites, reduce the blacks and add some real drama into this image. So you can see that that's made quite a significant difference. If I look at the before and after of that, You can see that that's significantly different with that graduated filter using a range mask. So it's a good way of selecting colors that you want to change in your image and you can do the same with luminances as well. On to point number five, which is just making subtle changes. I, I alluded to it just before. And if I take a look at an image where I may have done that, well, there's a few images here. So this is a good example. So this is an image that I took in a woodland that I go to all the time. I really love it. And there was this one time I went there where it's quite wet and damp and the, the, the greens were quite lush. And I was really taken aback by the sort of browns and greens of this image. And if I, if I show you the before and after, so before is that and after is that, but I've made a significant number of changes, but it's not made a, a, a huge change to the image, but it's significantly improved it. It's, it's made it have, have more of a character to the image. So you can see I've done lots of basic edits around the contrast and clarity, etc. I've done small changes to the HSL and all the colors of it. Um, I've done some split toning as well. So I've done split tonings to in, in, in change the highlights and, and make them slightly sort of more green and then make the shadows more orange. And I think that's made a big difference to the image. So if again, I look at the split tone and look at the before after, it's not huge, but it's, it, but it's enough change to make a difference. But all those things added together make for a, a very much improved image. So, so on all my images that I, I'm editing, I'm just looking at small changes, how I can make small changes as I go along to improve that image rather than just going in really heavy handed and making big, big changes. Okay, we're nearly there now, on to point number six. And that is, don't have black and white in your images. So don't think you need the deepest black and the whitest white in your image and a real good tonal range across the whole um, histogram. You don't need that, it's not important. And when you've exposed your image, you're trying to use all that histogram, but then when you edit it, you might change that somewhat. So this is a good example here. You can see that this is quite a sort of a pastel type shot. It was really misty and there was no blacks. There was just not any blacks. Now, if I um, increase the contrast of this image so that I stretch this out and then I reduce the exposure. So now I've got, I, I've, I've, I've sort of spread out that histogram. You can see that looks horrible. You know, we don't want that. So we, you know, we want it to be this very pastel image. There's no whites in this image and there's no blacks in this image. So don't be tempted to put blacks and whites in or, or, or think you will always need a dark tone in your image or a really light tone in your image because you just don't need to. Yeah, again, going back to this image here, there was no really whites in this image. So you can see there's a big gap there. And again, you can think, okay, well, I could probably increase the exposure and move it to there and it looked better, but it just doesn't, it doesn't create that mood. So don't be afraid of darkening your image, images down not to have too many whites or increasing the exposure of your image or reducing the contrast of your image. And I think you'll find that you'll, you'll get much more atmospheric shots. The final one, the seventh one, is go and get a cup of coffee, or even better, just sleep on it. So just go away, come back, and then just take a look at the image the next day. I've mentioned this before in videos, but I can't stress how important it is. There's so many times that I've started editing an image, spent maybe two hours editing an image, tweaking everything on it, and then just thought, ah, just don't like it. Come back the next morning and thought, wow, that's really good, I really, really like it. Or I've come back the next morning and thought, if I just change that, maybe darken the sky or lighten the foreground, then that might make a difference. But it's always a good idea to leave it, preferably overnight, or just go and get a coffee and come back to it. And I think you'll find that you either hate it more or like it more or find some changes that you, 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 want, you want to make to it, but it'll make, it'll change your opinion of that image. And I think that's really, really important. Okay, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed making it and it's made a difference to my photography, I think, because I've sort of 
start to think a little bit differently when I've been editing my photos and perhaps slow down a little bit and try to be a little bit more precise. One of the things that I did do during the making of this as well is complete or nearly complete my presets that I use. So I use these myself as, as a starting point occasionally when I'm, when I'm going through my photos and just trying different settings. I find it's another good way of seeing whether something works or it doesn't work. I can often do it when, when I'm away on my laptop as well, when I perhaps haven't got so much time to sit down and start from scratch. So I was in two minds of whether to put those up for sale. I think I probably will do, but I, I'd be interested to know whether anybody's interested in them. You know, they've taken me a long time to produce, a real, a really long time, but I don't, I don't want to charge, you know, all that time in, in the actual price of the presets. I, I, I expect I'll probably charge around about £10 for the presets. But if you are interested, if you, if you do want me to put those up for sale, then let me know. I'll put a link in the comments below. And when I do finish them, I'll send out a link to, to those people. And I'll probably put a link somewhere else on my website as well. I've also just released four or five workshops, um, two of which are worth re really worth noting. One is a really great one in, in the winter in the Lake District. And I released those to everybody on my email newsletter. And there's two places on that left now. Um, and then and it may, may have gone by the time this video goes out, so sorry if that's wrong. And the other one is an Iceland sort of video and photo trip. So I've, there's only three places in total and one of those places is gone. So again, there's only two places left on that trip. The link's in the description below. And yeah, that's, that's it really. Thanks ever so much for watching. And until next Sunday, bye.